to do. I never We're live. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, never so, really be present about the thing you're doing in the first place because you're just going from one to the next. Very true. Let, let's just intro first, mate. Um, so this is episode 100 of the podcast, and it's very special. So started the podcast in November 2021, and it's been great. So my best buddy in the world, Cahill, is going to join the podcast today. I've been trying to get him on for, <laughs> for two years. <laughs> He said he, he wanted to wait until we got to at least 100 episodes before he said he'd make an appearance. So, yeah, we're just going to kind of talk about um, what we've been working on, some lessons, some mistakes, and uh, just having a, a, an organic conversation. So, Carl, do you want to tell people a quick intro, who you are, a bit about yourself, and then we'll jump in. Yeah, sure, sure. Thanks very much, mate. Um, I feel very honoured and blessed to be with you on your a hundred episode of your podcast. Um, I suppose just uh, we were having a brief chat before you press record and another topic of conversation definitely that I think has been something that's been very obvious and profound and very powerful for us too has been consistency as well and just like never stopping. So to think that you've got to a hundred episodes now and definitely something I'm noticing in, in my own life specifically now with, with my music and my spoken word is that, yeah, just getting better with stuff over time, you know, and obviously I've known you for a long time, been on this journey with you for, for, from the way back and just from seeing your very first podcast, your very first video, <laughs> even like your very first YouTube, it could have been like a, some type of yoga or stretching video and from Thailand or something you made, like, you know, and just, yeah the progress from there to now and even you looking at your videos then and be like oh god man that's you know it's shit like you know and and it probably was looking back at it now but like you know a thousand videos later you know, a hundred podcasts later um everything improves over time and that's just so important for everyone to know that's that that story because i think you hear it but to know information but to actually apply it to yourself and feel it working i think is very different and that cycles back into the mindset again like that you know, I know that if I work on things over a long periods of time, I will get better at them. But even when you're going through that and you know it, there's still a voice inside saying, yeah, but not for me, though. It's not going to work for me. Like it might work for other people. And I know that's how people learn things. But I'm different. People don't realize that I'm more fucked up than they are. And I'm not as good as them or whatever, you know. And um, even though I'm probably segueing into a different conversation now for an introductory about who I am. That's my, that would have been my default mindset for most of my whole entire life like that, you know, that um, I wasn't as good as other people. I wasn't enough as I am, even though like, yeah, it's OK, I'm pretty decent at some things. I'll never get to a stage where I could be very content or happy or because that's just not in my um, not in my pattern or, or mindset, I suppose. So, um, you know, I'm someone who's who's dealt with lots of mental health difficulties in my 36 years of my life on this planet. Um, I love living. I love being alive. It's been an absolute journey, you know, to get to where I am now. I wouldn't change it or have it any other way, but definitely lots of struggles and difficulties, but also lots of amazing things, you know, even just in our relationship since I've known you, we've been so blessed to experience so many great um, memories, you know, experiences, actually physical experiences in life. Um, I like, I like trying to understand the world that we live in understand myself uh, build strong relationships with my friends and family because i really think like community and connection and, and actual other people are are where it's at like you know what life is all about it's not about individual um individual goals in some regard or experiences but collective experiences and which you talk a lot about recently now in your business model when it's a win-win when you're doing something and you're benefiting and someone else is benefiting from what you're doing as well, and you're both benefiting together, then that's the win-win model, you know? And if you can apply that model to, well, you're doing something and winning, now suddenly 10 people are benefiting from that. A hundred people are benefiting from that. You know, I think the more we break into a symbiotic mindset or a hive mind mindset, uh, everything exponentially gets better and bigger as well. Um, so yeah, just someone who's, trying to navigate this world and enjoy time with their friends and family and learn and grow. And yeah, just very, at this moment in time, very honored to be alive 
and to be your friend and to be yeah just continually growing and experiencing mate and life is good <laughs> yeah likewise man it's it's i think it's a good kind of topic to talk about because like something that you've helped me with so much is just um feeling like i can be myself around you and then i can now i'm passing that kind of way of thinking onto people around me which is lovely um <clears throat> and that's i think the block for a lot of people or for me at least before you helped me there was uh feeling a bit afraid of judgment and it comes back to getting better at stuff as well you know so like you want to have open great you know deep connections with people the reason we're so close is because we've gone super open and deep on everything you know so I can just say how I feel or share you know everything about me like every single thing um which I feel blessed because I know a lot of men in particular just they don't have someone like that in their corner mm. um and then like the thing I've been thinking about so much recently in particular with like dancing has just been such a a minefield like is the thing about it's you know the thing about consistency is it's really simple you just keep showing up like just record a podcast every week you have 100 podcasts in two years or whatever mm -hmm. um put out content or go to the gym or follow you know eat certain foods and you're going to be at, at a certain place in six or 12 months mm -hmm. but the difficult part is the discomfort of being terrible at the thing and failing and then it's not your fear of other people judging you it's actually you judging yourself I'm shit I'm you know what am I doing you know you get in your own head and that's been so interesting to relive all that now again with with dancing and with Spanish Spanish oh well I'm you know I'm a native English speaker you know so most native English speakers don't don't ever get a language or no, no one I know is you know good at languages or no one I know can dance so this is never going to work out for me you know and it's the same with people with fitness or with relationships or with a business or it's the exact same thing that's you know sidelining people so I think that's probably a good thing to talk about now like maybe um because it, it it can be in any area you know it could be like oh I want to make friends or different friends but I'm not putting myself out there because I'm afraid if I ask someone to you know catch up for a coffee they might be like no like you're you're a loser I don't want to hang out with you you know uh so just being first I think is a really it's a good concept you know like with everything I think that's it. but it's hard because you're risking putting yourself out there and being shot down like what mm -hmm. do you think yeah, it's the same. Yeah, it's it's the same thing, man. It's like, where is it from? Lao Tzu? Is it the um, war of art, the art war? The quote, uh, Rogan used it the whole time. Once you see the way broadly, or once you understand the way broadly, you see it in everything. And like, I think, mm. or even though you've mentioned like three or four topics of conversation today, it's all comes back down to the same thing again, really, which is the mindset concept, you know, that so what is it you use the example of like okay so say someone's starting to do a podcast and they do one and they're kind of oh this is kind of cool maybe I yeah two comes in three four so suddenly five you're kind of like six okay mm, as, am I as good as it is or some that week then something else comes up instead and there's a you know you were doing one a week and now suddenly a week's gone it's come in two weeks you haven't done one now it's like, oh I haven't done it for two weeks now so oh maybe I'll never do it again sure why who wants to listen to me anyway so like what was that bump in the road that stopped the person from that trajectory moment of doing something and then this inner dialogue coming in and then you know it's like I suppose being linking it back to the concept of meditation again it's like thinking that progress is going to be linear and and thinking that you're meant to feel change happening consistency consistently when you're doing something it's like what I suppose I would have liked to have known earlier, someone sat me down earlier in my life and, and was like, really, like, okay, man, this is the story now. Like learning anything in life, no matter who you are, because you're not special. You're not different to other people. I'm sorry. You might've been through a really, really difficult time in your life, but guess what? Most people have been as well. 
you might feel like that you're no good or that other people are different to you and they've got different avenues and genetics but guess what like so so does everybody else you really have to get this into your mind now that you're not special you're not different and this is a blueprint that will work for everybody and i haven't seen it not work yet as well you know if you commit to love and loving yourself and forgiving yourself and understanding that when you start something, no matter what it is, no matter what it is, it all it works the same, that you will not be good at it at start more than likely. And maybe if you are, you might have some attributes that are better suited towards this skill set than a different skill set. And then someone else will do something else that will have a better skill set than you in a different concept instead. But what will happen is that over a period of time, no matter how good you are at the start, you will plateau. And there will be a sense that you're stupid and you're shit and this isn't going to be for you. And when you get to that moment in time, because you will get to that moment in time, you just keep going. <laughs> and after a period of time, that uncomfortable feeling that you have will start to go away again. And then you'll start to see progress again. And then you'll be like, oh my God, actually, I can do this. This is class. And you'll keep going again and then you'll plateau again. And then you'll feel like, oh no, I'm shit again. And you'll be like, oh my God, I got, thought I got past this and now I'm back here again. Now I'm shit. I knew I fucking, at the start when I felt that I was shit and I knew I wasn't going to be able to do it, I told you you were going to get here and now you're here and now I told you you're shit and you're not going to be able to do it. And then you just keep going again, like, you know? And then that just keeps happening over time. Every time you get to a pass of you, you succeed for a period of time or you progress, then you can plateau or then you think you're going backwards and then, you know, you think you're even worse than you were at the start and then it happens again and then, you just keep going, man. And it's just about being consistent through uncomfortable situations. And as you said, that can be applied to learning a musical instrument, going to the gym, talking in relationships, uh, talking to girls, going for job interviews. It's just like realizing that if you are consistent with something and can hold space for yourself to feel whatever you're feeling in that moment in time, you're going to get better. Like, you know, and um, I suppose understanding that or like hearing that from a logical point of view, it makes sense. But then to feel it from a somatic point of view, you actually like you have to feel uncomfortable because that's the number one human sensation that we're running away from all the time, feeling uncomfortable. And then what does it feel? What does, if you want to describe what something feels to be uncomfortable, it's you know, in your body. Okay, so say like the sensation of being panicky. So like shallow breathing, maybe sweating. When I start to sweat, that that makes me feel really uncomfortable because I think it links back into like shame. You know, if I was to have like a sweaty armpit when I'm doing something, I'd be like, oh my God, everyone's going to see me. Everyone knows I'm sweating. Everyone thinks. So if I start sweating when I'm doing something, that triggers more insecurities for me. Like, and then like my mind can just go, Whack. and I could just like run out of the room <laughs> screaming. But inside, I'm just like trying to keep it together. And then I'm just like, oh, yeah, man, but you're like, you're doing an activity that's like really like a physical, like dancing, per se, or jiu-jitsu. So oh, like, I was going to say, like, you shouldn't do salsa if you're worried about sweating yeah. and, and, oh, and well, getting man. judged. <laughs> yeah, just so interesting. Like, you know, so um, I suppose, yeah, a little bit of a ramble again on that topic. But it's just, yeah, like being mm. consistent and understanding learning because everything is learning. And now you can pigeonhole it again to like, I suppose what you and I do a lot of as well is skill build. You know, that's another like umbrella of topics where like even I was only thinking about yesterday or the day before, you know, like we're both 36 now and we've known each other for a long time. But one thing I sometimes struggle with is that even though we've changed so much since we've known each other, like at the heart of it all is still you're still Connor and I'm still Kyle, the same people we were when we were 16 in some regard, you know, our, our, mm -hmm. our morals and values might be different, but the essence is still the same. And sometimes because I don't feel different to how I felt when I was a child, and my dad talks about this as well, but yet we are much, much wiser than we were then as well. So it's like embodying the change that you've built up over long periods of time to realize that you're not the same kid you were once, and once when you were a child. You know, I'm just like developed. It's even hard for me to say it out loud because I still feel like, ugh, like that I'm, you know, a good person, like, and that I've developed good skills to make good judgment calls. I definitely am wiser than I was. And like, it's still, like I said, I still feel sick nearly to say like that. I have developed myself into a good, well-rounded human being. That nearly makes me feel uncomfortable because I'm like, oh, geez, who's this guy saying that he's actually good at stuff? Like, you know, or has done well for himself because that's still so hard, I feel, for 
an Irish person to say, for a man to say, you know, to feel proud of myself. Literally, I actually feel that kind of physically going to get sick in my chest now and say that I'm proud of myself, like, you know. Um, and that because we develop these different characteristics of putting ourselves through situations where we felt uncomfortable a lot to kind of segue back into the learning aspect again as well. And it comes in from when I did the past now for the first time, because obviously you and I have, would have had a, would have spent a lot of time meditating together, doing yoga together, pursuing that lifestyle of like um, discipline, diligence, doing hard things, definitely with the um, element of using the whip at the start of our journey of being like a um, middle, you know, early 20s male where we got into really hit the gym hard, really hit, you know, psychology hard, but then definitely came at it from like um, an aggressive standpoint or being hard to ourselves to push ourselves, which I think every man goes through at some stage in their lives. And, and there's great benefit from that too as well, but it's just not a sustainable way of living, which you and I both uh, have came to realize as well. But I did love the concept of when I started meditating for long periods of time, because obviously at the start of that journey, five, 10, 15 minutes of sitting, it was just excruciatingly difficult from a physical pain point of view, but also a mental pain point of view. But what a great golden nugget to like hear that if you're in pain when you're meditating, by all means, change your position. Like you're, we're not looking for people to be in pain when you're learning a skill set, when you're doing anything. But notice the difference between when you're in pain and when you're uncomfortable. And that fucking blew my mind off because every time I was moving my legs, it was like, oh, fuck, I'm in pain. Oh, Jesus Christ. Oh, that was what I was thinking was happening. But then I was just like, am I in pain or am I uncomfortable? And then I was like, oh, dude, this is just, I'm uncomfortable. But can I stay sitting in this position for longer periods of time? Definitely. And then suddenly it's like, Okay, I'm going to move again. Wait, hold on a second. Is it uncomfortable or is it pain? No, that's uncomfortable again. Okay, I can stay longer. And suddenly then you're like, the 10 minutes, 20, it just rolls on and on. And then once you get better being uncomfortable, that's then when everything just opens up to you because it's like the analogy again of the comfort circle. If you're, you know, in this circle here. Oh, it hurts. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> so Dude. there's for people listening, Zoom is <laughs> making love hurts. <laughs> so funny. I noticed when I was doing a thumbs up earlier as well, there was a little a thumbs up emoji came up too as well. But yeah, you know, in the circle of being comfortable, you're staying inside this comfortability circle and you can't get out of it because you're like, oh, I'm good at soccer. So I'll just play soccer because that's what I'm good at, you know, or. Yep. And then as soon as you go outside that circle of being uncomfortable, the circle gets bigger and bigger and then the world gets bigger mm -hmm. and bigger. And then everything. Yeah, it's just so paradoxical again that. Um, you think by staying safe and secure and chasing all the nice, happy feelings that that's where life is. But actually, it's when you start going into feeling uncomfortable and all the difficult emotions, that stuff opens up. And then that can link into doing shadow work. That can link into going into your inner child. That can link into, you know, processing feelings you were running away from when you were a child too. And then everything opens up from that also. So everything just comes back to being connected together to this his concept of like learning, letting go, feeling uncomfortable. Um, it's very interesting, man. Like it's so fucking, so trippy. And then it also makes so much sense. That's what I've really been cultivating recently. It's like, this makes so much sense. Of course, this is working. Of course, I'm feeling good. Of course, I'm content. Of course, I'm feeling loved. Of course, I feel safe now. It makes so much sense. Whereas in the past, nothing made sense. Everything was confusing. Um, but then that's also part of the process as well, you know. So, yeah, it's very interesting, man. Yeah, I think it's like the expectations. I think is a huge thing as well when you're starting something new. Like, um, let's just use a fitness example, like, or with any example. If you're not in the place that you think you should be at a certain time, you're unhappy that's kind of what happens like oh I thought I'd be here and I'm down here oh I feel bad and uh it was interesting uh, again I'm going to be using dancing as the the, the, oh, yeah. the vehicle to explain all this because I've just it's so recent but I think a lot of people will will resonate with it on let's just say fitness or nutrition that type of stuff I think where a lot of people listening are, are kind of on that journey but it can be with anything and uh 
I was like, okay, cool. You know, 2023, I'm going to learn to dance. And, you know, end of the year, I'm going to be amazing at dancing. <laughs> you know, like that's it. And then obviously life happened. I danced throughout the year, but then the problem was I was looking at other guys who were dancing and I was like, oh, I'm going to be, you know, as good as him. And then I wasn't. And I was like, oh, shit, like I'm, I'm a pro there's something wrong with me because I'm not as good as this guy yet you know and then I, and then I talked to the guy I'm like how long have you been dancing he's like oh 12 years I'm like all right okay like you know how long have you been dancing four years six years how, how often do you practice every day same in the fitness industry like I love interviewing like really high level guys like uh or, or women like uh from like a calisthenic standpoint it's like how how long have you been training for? Like how, and he's like, ah, well, about 10 years and four to five days a week for about three to four hours is my session, you know? So it's like, okay, cool. So like, I'm not willing to put in 20 hours a week to get to this level. So I'm okay letting go of not having a one-arm handstand or all of this other stuff, you know? Um, so I think, yeah, just the expectations, like dropping the bar and just focusing on like, okay, the the behavior I just want to cultivate is I just like dancing for the sake of dancing and I'm going to try and enjoy the process rather than trying to get there and playing the long game I think is the biggest it's the hardest thing but it's the best thing to do as well like so I'm not trying to do this for a year to get to a certain level I like personally I want to dance until I'm 90 like that's what I want to do so I'm going to just like I'm gonna be amazing at dancing, like at some in, ten, in ten years, like I'm sure. Um, and just treat it the way I, I treat it training now. You know, I don't go to the gym and be like, oh shit, you know, the bad day today. It's just like a thing I do because I've been doing it for eighteen years. So I just it's like brushing my teeth now. You know, it's just part of my routine. Awesome. Um, exactly. But then just on your point about like meditation, like all these things can become like you're doing all the right things and like. I think a lot of people, myself and you always talk about this, like the personal development trap you can get into is you're always trying to improve and get better because you're not good enough for where you're currently at, um, which I think is just something to be aware of as well. And it's just trying to, like you were saying, Kyle, like just reflect on, boy, you know, I'm proud of myself. I'm, pr I'm proud of the things that I've done to date and I want to keep progressing and improving but also like you know just looking back and all the things that have changed as well in the last three six twelve months two years like we do a lot of this with our with clients like it's always about like what have what have your wins been what are you happiest about you know what's gone well because we're always future focused like we're always thinking like the next thing and then you hit the thing you get to your goal and then you're like oh well now there's an hour peak beyond that that I didn't even realize and I want to get to that now you know yeah yeah, so well said, man, as well. Like it's it's uh just touching back from well, the trap, first of all, is an important thing to talk about. You just mentioned expectations as well. So, like, yeah, just you know, I would in a pattern with you, I would have noticed over the last how many years as well, as like, yeah, always been like at the end of this year, I'm gonna have this, 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 and this done. And if I don't, then it's like, you know, even though at the start of the year you might be like, Well, if I don't get there, at least I'll be closer to it, but then still be harsh on yourself, harsh on yourself for not being maybe where you wanted to be because you were also doing lots of things at the same time. As you mentioned, not just one skill. And that then ties into comparing yourself to others, which is obviously is trap 101 as well. Like, you know, we're like, well, this guy is a normal dude as well. And he's, you know, same age as me or close to where I am. Why is he so much better? But as you usually said, then I kind of, you can't really break people up into two categories, even though it's still kind of like short is that, yeah, either a specialist or a generalist, you know? And uh, especially in, because you and I delve into many different hobbies and interests and experiences you come across people in those genres who are shit hot at them like you know so for me at the moment jiu-jitsu dancing free diving you know all things that we are we're doing and you're like okay this guy's a black belt and or for me with jiu-jitsu again same with you with dancing you know some person that i started jiu-jitsu with six years ago is now a brown belt and i'm still a blue belt you know and it's like oh fuck man why is that the case I was like, oh, because yeah, that dude hasn't done, no, that's he hasn't done anything else. He's trained jiu-jitsu four to five days a week, every single day, a week since he started training. Whereas I've never trained more consistently, I'd say, than probably four to six months. 
Then I take a break for three to four months, six months. Then I start again. Then I break and start again. Now that itself was problematic for me because I was like, why is this happening to me? I'm stopping and starting. But it's also because at the same time I'm doing, uh, you know, yoga. I'm also doing meditation. I'm also doing dancing. I'm also doing rock climbing. I'm also doing surfing. I'm also doing free diving. I'm also have a full time job. I'm also working diligently on my relationship. I'm also trying to be a good son. I'm also trying to be a good friend. I'm also trying to be a good partner. Like you know, so it's like juggling in some regard all these different things, but then also like being realistic about what kind of lifestyle you do want because when you're a generalist and you're watching a specialist you know mm. it's very dangerous to be in that mindset of comparison again because it's completely different and i always say once again i don't want to be a specialist i'm so happy that there's people out there like just at the moment i suppose a big um awe that i'm in, in is that in limerick city where i'm currently living and uh staying at the moment and the jiu-jitsu gym that i'm part of is called 3d grappling and for people who aren't, you know, into jiu-jitsu and don't know about it or don't really know the notoriety of certain things, we have uh, our coach, our head coach, Tom Halpin, is like, you know, one of the best black belts in the world and is known in his weight class in his field as like such a big expert. People come from all over the world to train with him and with us and they have done over the last year. The gym has only been open in the last year. But just to have that high level skill set on my doorstep to be able to go in and, and practice with this man who's also so sound and has cultivated this amazing learning um, motto in the gym where we're all benefiting from together. You know, it's just such an amazing thing. But he obviously is a professional sports athlete, trains six days a week and has done, and you know, the commitment he has to that lifestyle and to that, to get to where he has got to is insane. But I couldn't do that personally myself. But I'm so happy that there's people out there who are willing to commit to this love of doing one thing and being coming really good at it because then they can share their knowledge with other people, you know, and it's just a beautiful thing, but like, it wouldn't be fun if everyone was just good at one thing in the world. And it wouldn't be fun if everyone wasn't good at one good thing specifically either. So it's very important. I think you need to decide yourself what kind of guy you are. And like, once you success, a part of accepting who you are also as well, and knowing that you can't get as good as other people, if you're not going to apply as much time as they are to as well. But if you don't want to do those things, then why would you? Because for a long time, I was there trying to make myself a specialist. And I thought that there was something wrong with me because I hadn't found something that I could just dedicate all my time to and become obsessed about until I found an umbrella, which now my obsession is just movement. And what's so great about that is that, so I don't care now what I'm doing really once I'm doing some form of skill set based movement practice. And then that's why then jujitsu falls underneath that. Rock climbing falls into that, dancing falls into that, free diving falls into that, cycling falls into that, frisbee falls into that, fucking uh, slack lining. You know, there's just so, and they're all, they all make, they, they all make each other better, which is what I fucking love about it. Like my rock climbing makes my jujitsu better. My jujitsu makes my surfing better. My surfing makes my free diving better. Like it's just all interchangeable. But the big thing that I, was happening with me is what you're talking about at the start of the conversation as well is that I've gone from a place where I'm beating myself up and the things that I enjoyed enjoy do, doing became negative for me because I was trying to get better and achieve. Now I'm just fucking having fun, man. I'm just having fun. I'm enjoying myself. I'm enjoying the movement. I'm enjoying the social aspect of it. That's what with dancing, with jujitsu, acro yoga, meeting people, spending time physically touching people, spending time around people spending time with the same people who want to get better at a certain skill set so we're all having fun together and we're all learning together that's what i think in in the last couple of weeks specifically the breakthrough has been for me to nugget as well it's like oh yeah it's about doing this thing which is really enjoyable but doing it with other people as well who are also enjoying it and it's just fucking beautiful man like jesus um speaking of dancing as well i spoke to you briefly about this but the the five rhythms dance is something that i was only exposed to recently i did it again on friday this friday and column came as well and mariam actually as well which was class because it's out of all the things i found i think it's nearly the thing that i'm enjoying the most i suppose as of recent because the box is out of ticks so we're dancing straight away which i love which is amazing um it's from a sober standpoint of view as well like you know so everyone's just going in there to like feel and move and, and be together uh it's like a ceremonial space 
So like I just love the um experience of a ritual. You know, a lot of people talk about that recently as well, how how important rituals are to go back from the Japanese tea, you know, ceremonies to coffee to <laughs> here, here to sitting down for dinner, you know, like prayer before dinner, which obviously, you know, you and I aren't don't have a religious, even though we've grown up in a religious country, we're not like practicing, but I still practice like just gratitude. Like that's meta meditation for me, are my prayers, my mantras, whatever. Um but when there is, you know, intention set at the start of something as well, we're all in it together. You're setting a safe space for people to move and to experience. Um, the one we went to on Friday, I'd say there was a person there, a girl, maybe like 19, 20, up to a woman who was like, they're in their late 70s, um, all different shapes and sizes. At the start of the class, it says, doesn't matter if you're, you know, color of your skin is not important. Race is important, religion is not important, sex is important, or sexual orientation is important. We're all here just to move and be free together and dance. And oh, Can you man. explain what it is for people? Yeah, so the five rhythms, the concept was um, invented by uh, a woman. I'm not sure of the woman's name at the moment, but basically it's conceptually moving the body. The dance, I suppose, is that everybody, the concept is everyone has their own beat inside them their own rhythm inside them their own movement pattern and it follows the concept that our body once we get out of our mind our body knows what to do by itself a lot of times that's also something that we've spoken about together a lot as well so we sometimes think again that we are our mind we are our thoughts and that we live in our head and for lots of people myself included that was a very difficult concept for me to understand because I was so in my head that I didn't understand the concept of, I suppose, having a body or coming into the body and, and feeling inside. And basically the five rhythms opens up the possibility of following your own rhythm. So when you go to dance and when you're dancing, a lot of the time we're looking at other people, that's a massive part of the concept and looking how they're moving and oh God, they're moving better than me or I'm not moving the same as them or they're a better dancer than me. So straight away, you're going to do a comparison, which is holding you back from your own natural movement. So if you can drop the concept of looking at other people and just thinking to yourself, I have my own dance inside me that's completely unique to me and it won't look the same as anybody else's. It won't feel the same as anybody else's. And it doesn't need to be. It just needs to be my own dance that I can tap into and move my body. And that could be a shake of your hand. It could be a shake of your foot. It could be a rattle of your head, a spin of your shoulders. It doesn't make a difference. But the music is set up so that there's certain beats and frequencies that whatever you feel that feels good in your body, you just start following that movement pattern. And then it might take you to a, a shoulder roll. It could take you to the floor. It could take you to the wall. It doesn't make a difference. The thing is that you're just staying in the present moment and having fun and moving your body. And then through that process, it's for an hour and a half, there's like a journey where the music goes intense and then it comes down and so like basically it becomes a full on rave to the grave at some stage, like <laughs> getting buckets, like hanging by the window, being able, barely able to breathe, getting with water in, thinking you've got nothing left in the tank. And then another song comes on and you just start going at it again. Um, and what I found with all these processes too, that are kind of linked into the same concept, it's like playing music together in a group, dancing together in a group. It's not all enjoyable. That's also something that's important to remember as well about doing anything is that you think just because you like to do something means that you're going to enjoy doing it every time. That's also a big trap as well, because in this hour and a half that we are in the Five Rhythms work, dance workshop, having a, a beautiful time, it's one of the best things I've done ever again. Half of it, I wasn't, I didn't enjoy, I'd say. And what I mean by that is that it brought up emotions in me that were difficult to sit with and be uncomfortable with. Like, I'm a loser. I'm not good enough. Everyone's looking at me. You know, everyone's like, dancing around going who is this guy he think he's a he's a he's a he's a, you know, he's a loser like you know the state of him and then you got to go through that and then something something better happens again and then you go back into feeling like that again and you know you dance by yourself a lot and then at, there's a dj a woman who's you know, holding space and talking through the music and then she'd ask you to pick a partner to dance with and make eye contact with that partner and then dance together and that's uncomfortable at the start and then it becomes beautiful 
and there's different practices like where you're trying to move around the room but still stay dancing together even through loads of other people dancing in between you so you're still cool. you with space um so yeah it's just it's beautiful man like it's just amazing but it comes back to the same concept again doing something that's very vulnerable you know very uh scary but then when you do it in a place that's safe with like-minded people who aren't going to make fun of you if actually cheer you on, do the opposite, want you to succeed, want you to do better. And then we have a sharing circle at the end when we talk about it. And it's so beautiful because the teacher made a really good remark the month previously when I was at it. And because, you know, we go to many different workshops, we go to many different classes and we go to many different um, activities and it's kind of like cheesy, but so beautiful too as well. But she said that, you know, there's going to be many, many dance workshops you go to and there'll be many fifth and five rhythm workshops all over the world. But for this moment in time, at this workshop in Limerick, at this time with this amount of people, it'll never be the same again. So this one was special because everyone that's in this room was here now at the moment and whatever music was played or whatever moment in time, they'll never be the same as this again. And that's so beautiful. I was like really emotional because it was so special. But then you, I can, you can apply that thought process to every moment ever in your life. And it'll never be the same again. And you know, if, I, if you and me meet up now soon again, and we're like, oh, me and Connor, Kyle and Connor are back together again. We'll go for a walk. That walk will never be repeated again. That moment in time will never be repeated again. And that, I just think, is just so special. you know. And it's made me realize that more so than ever again, every moment is so special. And every moment will never be had again. So enjoy it, you know, and linking back into the concept then of waiting for something to happen or thinking that we're just going to do one more workshop or read one more book or do one more podcast and then we'll get the thing we've been looking for whether it's, it's always accessible to you like everything you've ever wanted in your whole entire life everything you've been looking for was already here all the time just waiting for you to to feel it to, to know it that you know you are enough we are enough this world is beautiful and we're definitely here to learn and have fun and to enjoy ourselves um, not to be caught in this suffering light looper or, or uh, mindset, you know, but it's also part of the process. So it's, it's so paradoxical, but so beautiful at the same time. Yeah, man, I think it's a really nice um, thing to think about. Like, it's a good way of not taking things for granted. Like I could find just, you know, I'm not in a good mood or in good form. Or I don't feel good or whatever. And I can get into this mindset of like, oh, you know, once, you know, once I'm there, then I'll feel better about X, Y, or Z or life will be better or whatever. <clears throat> but also like I could get hit by a bus tomorrow <laughs> or like lose my leg. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be like, oh man, like why didn't I, you know, I think a really good thing that I've been thinking about a lot recently is like, you know if i was 80 mm. you'd be like you're fucking 36 like dude you can do everything like why are you not doing all the stuff that like i'm 80 now like jesus i wish i was 36 now you know so you can completely flip the script i think that's a really um powerful way to think about things uh also yeah. around the 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 dance i uh, i find it like just the letting go is such a difficult part of it like in particular when you're with even when you're by when i'm by myself but with other people i'm like i look so like I, i'm doing everything wrong or i look you know you're really it's really uncomfortable also like it's very associated with for me and i think a lot of people from ireland and a lot of countries with a drinking culture is like you let go when you're drunk um because you don't care anymore you know and then when you're doing it sober like i have you know i've been all my social dancing now has been i haven't drank in almost two years um you have to really just be like oh I, this is really uncomfortable i can feel like everyone's looking at me but then once you work through that you're like oh no no one's looking at me i'm just looking at myself judging myself like, that's what's happening here which i think that was the biggest breakthrough for me with with dancing and then I was talking to a guy uh, last weekend. I love talking to people in the dance community, like because I'm there. Everyone's at a different level, but like I'm, you know, I'm like oh, I'm asking everyone so many questions. Mm. And uh, he's been right. dancing for twelve years. He's amazing. This guy, 
And when I saw him the first time, I was kind of like a, a little bit intimidated because he was so good. And then the next time I went up and I was like, man, you're a really good dancer. Like, you know, how long have you been dancing? Whereas in the past, I would just like, I would create this um, invisible barrier because the person's really good at something, which actually doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked him and he was like, yeah, I've been dancing for 12 years. Uh, I just do because, I, you know, he just really likes he just likes the outlet like it's a really good outlet for him physically emotionally socially all these things and he made a really good point he was like there's two types of people who dance there's the people who get who compare themselves and i feel it. so comparison or inspiration mm -hmm. uh from what's going on so you walk into a place and this can be in any area whatever you go into a gym you compare yourself, all these people are better than me, I'm a piece of shit. Or you're like, wow, I can be, you know, I can go in the direction of these people if I keep showing up. It's, you know, it's, it's so different, like the way you can frame that. So like going in, so like last year, I'd be like, oh man, you know, these people are so good at dancing and I'm shit. <laughs> now I'm like, oh, this is, that's awesome. That's so cool. Wow. If I keep practicing, I'll be able to do these moves. Maybe not as good, but like I'll be able to do, you know, and take more part in this. And that's such a. You'll be better. <laughs> it better be. Here's out there, not... Maybe not as good. There's even that little tiny bit inside you still, like, or like, you know, genuinely. You can see your body language, then you said it as well, like, you know, I could do it too. Maybe not as good, like, you know, but. <laughs> holding back a little bit but I, I know what you mean of course man yeah that's a fucking that's a, a absolute whomper of a golden nugget there like you know um yeah. and what does it tell you about yourself not you but again the, like what you just said again when i realized that people weren't looking at me it was just me judging myself like there's just the layers behind so much stuff man it's just there's there's, there's, so, there's so much depth behind things people get to a certain point again where it's an emotion or a thought pattern and they're like it just stops there you know, but there's just, if you keep going down, oh yeah, the reason I feel like this is because I was insecure as a child, or I, when I was young, I, I became embarrassed with a group of friends, and now I'm scared to do anything vulnerable because I don't want to be laughed at again, and it's still permeating through you all these years later, and you haven't realized that, you know, it's just, it's fascinating stuff, um, and interesting why dancing specifically <clears throat> brings out a lot of that stuff in lots of people, like, you know, and this isn't just you and me, we're having these uh realizations i suppose but then you can't have it in anything you know we, we just because you and i are doing these certain avenues if someone was doing you know like paragliding or uh you know sailing or playing a musical instrument the same lessons and patterns come out and all those things too as well um but it is interesting like things that to do with rhythm so like in music language uh dancing things that i feel are very um like culturally ingrained in us from you know if you go back to whatever tribal times you know um previous you know times in the past again all communities all cultures have tradition of dance music singing movement and in ireland we were speaking about this again on friday night the risk the rigidity the restrictiveness of our movement <laughs> of our singing of our dancing like you know irish people are so wild and have such a beautiful energy and this movement and dance we've really lost it in our culture we really became very strict and rigid and you know i think that's because if you look at the drinking culture again obviously in ireland that could be linked to difficult in our trauma in our past uh, uh from being suppressed and by being ruled and colonized um but then also this love of dancing because if you go into any nightclub in ireland uh any weekend it's going to be mobbed and people are going to be dancing but everyone's going to be inebriated, like our langers are out of their mind. So like the want, the want for movement is there. It's just also the want to, you know, there's a, there's a way to do it without being langers too as well. Like that doesn't mean that drinking is, is wrong or that having a few drinks and moving is fine. But if you want to dance and you feel like you can dance without drinking, then that's more problematic, I suppose, you know, from long-term health. Because if you're doing this thing you want to do every weekend, but to do it, you have to, you know, spend a lot of money and put pressure on your health system and on your sure your own health by consuming large quantities of certain substances um it can be more tricky as well like you know so just yeah interesting yeah. but i think it's more of a like 
not even Ireland. It's like a Northern European thing. Like we're just stiffer in general here. Like versus I, I, I was in, I think I was ta- talking to you about this, like when I was in the Canaries earlier in the year and the guy I was staying with in an Airbnb, he lived in Sweden for like eight years. So he he's from Tenerife and like people in Tenerife are very more, almost like more like Latin America than it's a really strong like Venezuelan population there. So they're very like, you know, dance and movement focused. And they're very also close, very close when they talk to you. That's always like interesting as well. Yes. But he was just we were talking about like the the differences in not even just movement, just in like like getting close to people in Sweden versus in Tenerife and he was like it's way easier to meet people in Tenerife <clears throat> like people are just way chattier and it's you can you know it's way more social there's way more opportunities to meet but he made a good point which was like once you get in with people in Sweden like it takes way longer than like you yeah. are like blood you know what I mean like so <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah 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 it's yeah so he was like the it's you know maybe it's more social but then it's also more shallow and kind of surface level in in Tenerife and then it was harder to break in in Sweden but then you know people are stiff and uptight and he was talking about this whole drink thing as well like people would just be so you know kind of robotic and then they would get wrecked at the weekends and everything would come out so it's I don't think it's just an Irish thing it's like an yeah, it seems to be like a northern European thing, and there's no better yeah. or worse. Again, I think as well, like that's you made a good point about that. And this is something that came up recently for me. And um, so two weekends ago, I did a dance workshop as well called Zeroing, and this was really interesting. It was on for a whole day with a girl called Mary Noonan. She's like in her late sixties, um, contemporary dance. You know, she's dancing all her life. Like she's like a, an OG and um, really well known in in Ireland and and in Europe. Uh, just once again, you know, when you, you meet this person and you're like, unbeknownst to you, they're like, like shit hot, unreal, like this huge volume of work that they've done. And you're like, oh, I'm just doing this. I think it was like 25 quid for the workshop from 11 to six, like, you know, and just once again, what a bargain to spend time in this with this person. And she's been developing this concept of movement herself, you know, it's, it's going it's going to be going into their like gathering data about it and stuff like it's going to be written. Where is she out. from? Um. I don't want to say I'm I think Limerick, but uh, maybe not. Um, and sorry, Mary, if you're listening, <laughs> I'm not sure where you're from. Uh, but she was in my. I did a workshop with her in contemporary dance years ago as well. She's part of dance Limerick and uh, and works with the dance school and in, in University of Limerick as well. Um, but the concept of zeroing, it's like two. F- we we're trying to because it's hard again putting movement into words, you know. So we're trying. That was a big part of the whole day as well. It was like. We do this practice and then we try to vocalize how we were feeling while we were doing the practice. And that was really interesting because while other people were speaking, you know, you're like, oh my God, that's how I feel too as well. While we were doing this practice, it was very, very interesting. So basically there was her concept was being uni focused and then having distributed focused uh, and uni focused, say from a movement point of view would like say we're moving around a room. And what we would do is we'd focus our attention on one part of the room and then move towards that. And then when we got to that point, we would turn to somewhere else and pick another point and then move towards that. So it was very, we were uni focused and moving. And while we were doing this practice, we were doing it together as a group. But then she got half the group to sit out and watch the people moving while they were uni focused and then distributed focus. Another name for it is moving from the space from whence you came was that say you're walking towards something. But instead now of being focused on where you were going, you were open to the space around you and actually pay, paying as much attention where you're going in the forward motion as you were from the motion you just came from behind. So it was like you're aware of when you were moving forward, you were being aware of the space you were leaving behind you. That wow. was the point. Like, interesting. Yeah. So interesting. while I was doing that, you, you everyone moved differently. So when you were uni focused, this, the, the, what it looked like to watch people moving was more rigid, more strict, um, a little bit more anxiety focused nearly as well, like getting someplace like, you know, and it was more like kind of like marching, 
And then when everyone became distributed focused, everything became softer. You were literally, she'd be like, change, uni, distributed, uni, distributed. And you see it, people, this, it was so fascinating to watch, you know? And it may be linked into then, like sometimes how I feel in my body, where when I'm spending lots of time doing one thing or being focused or getting stuff done, because I felt that was how I spent a lot of my life in general, but also had a um, the mindset or the inner feeling of like being anxious with it as well i saw that as a bad thing you know and it became a negative like a bad part of myself like you know um and then when you were distributed and i was open i had this sense of peacefulness and that was what i was really chasing most of my life anyway was this feeling of peacefulness or contentment so i was like this is good and that's bad you know because that's how i would have dis uh, distinguished lots of things in my life i did this that was a good thing i did this that was a bad thing and then you're kind of keeping tallies of how much good and bad stuff you've done. And then if the good outweighs the bad, you're a good person. If not, you're a piece of shit. And that's fucking exhausting, as anyone who's practiced that before knows. It doesn't usually end well. Um, but then when I noticed I was doing this with the focus attention, that there was a benefit to being focused too as well. Because all that anxiety energy I had all of my life and that driving force to get become a better person, which with the whip was still negative in some regards. I got a lot of fucking stuff done, like, you know, and I fucking did a lot of things and that's good. So it made me realize that that part of myself that I was vilifying actually was playing a really important role in my life as well. So in this workshop, while we were just talking about movement, I was having this massive breakthrough. And I was beating myself up again for do it, be uni focused at times. But actually, that was a good part of me also as well. So even though in Ireland, again, we might have this mentality of like, you know, being hard to get into or this or that, or, and before I would have said that was a bad thing. And then being in Tenerife, being open and moving around is a good thing. Actually, they're both good and they're both bad at the same time. And it's important to, you know, that all aspects are good. So like it's, now that's even like tying back into like, there's no such thing as bad parts as well for ourselves, you know? And then I was like, geez, all that time I was beating myself up for doing all those things i was actually being a fucking legend you know and i should be really kind to that part of myself that was working so tirelessly because when you're uni focused a lot of the time bro it fucking takes so much energy and commitment and hard work but you do get stuff done you know and so i think it's about acknowledging both sides and both parts and realizing that just because you're doing one thing a certain way and when you're looking at someone else doing it a different way it's not better or worse it's just different you know, and I think that's important, too, because then if you're comparing yourselves to other people again, seeing someone doing something differently and you're doing it differently, you're like, oh, God, but really, once you're happy doing it the way thing you wanted to do and you're not hurting anyone else, then I think that's OK for everybody. Like, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, I yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I think maybe explain to people about the parts and everything, because that like breakthrough that you talked about, that was probably the most powerful part of ifs like internal family systems for me was you know hating the whatever the angry part the rage all these issues and uh accepting that as it, it was basically doing its best to to keep other parts of me safe within what was going on in, in those moments but do you want to maybe just explain that in a bit more detail what you mean by parts I think that would be helpful for people sure, yeah it's just so funny isn't it that how everything is still is coming around to the same stuff all the time like we've been talking for ages about start to certain topics and different things but it's all it's all the same stuff again like it's just so trippy and so paradoxical but then also makes so much sense that's what's so gnarly about this stuff you know so um yeah look just yeah one of our great mentors between the two of us tim ferris was uh the first time i heard the concept of ifs and it was also very interesting as well, I suppose, looking back at it now, because Tim Ferriss, who openly talks about being uh, sexually abused when he was a child, uh, which is something that resonates with me also as well. And then having these like memories about IFS, you go doing therapy and remembering about this part of himself and memories coming up and stuff being trapped in. That was what was the very first time I'd heard IFS, which is integrated family systems, as you mentioned. And then... Uh, you were the first person I knew in my life circle wise personally to actually do IFS therapy. And obviously because you and I have been so close and on this similar journey um, of different paths over our lives, 
anything you ever bring to the table, I always listen to because I know if you've looked into it and done it, it's obviously good. Um, I know that's how we both feel about each other. So I was like, okay, and I looked this up too as well and started doing therapy with IFS. And it made so much sense because it's also very much tied into um, like breath work with regards to like loving the self and um, holding space for yourself. Their tagline for IFS is reparenting yourself, which I um, resonated with so much because when you are in a shame um, cycle or a cycle of beating yourself up or, or self-flagellation or whichever way you want to describe it, you go through um, yo-yoing between being a good person and a bad person. I'm a good person, I'm a bad person, I'm a good person, I'm a bad person. I've done this, so I'm a good person. I've done this, so I'm a bad person. Um, that's really dangerous because you're pigeonholing yourself into a very shallow way of thinking and you're judging yourself based upon a very small window where you're, that you're looking through. So IFS, the concept, breaks yourself up into multiple parts. So some of those parts can be like your inner child or... Um, the exiles, we'll say. Yeah, yeah. exiles, um, firefighters, the self um and even Man though managers managers as well like yeah and even though ifs is its own system in itself it's still kind of similar to other systems where you know the wounded child comes up in many many different modules in young ian as well and the shadow work and basically it's understanding that we're much more complicated than we think we are um at, but at the same time being much more simple as well and understanding that at a certain stage in your life different parts would uh, manifest more than likely to protect yourself from a certain feeling or sensation that you experience specifically when you're a child um, under some form of traumatic situation, whether it be mental, physical, sexual, neglect, um, some strong emotion or feeling of separation from yourself that you've done something wrong and that you have to try to form some form of behavior to protect yourself or to self-soothe yourself. So <clears throat> most people have a part of themselves that they don't like. And then that part, a lot of the time, is called the shadow. And the shadow can manifest itself in many ways. Uh, usually it's in some form of self-soothing behavior. So whether it could be drink, drugs, pornography, uh, gambling, eating, it doesn't have to be something that we consider a negative addiction because my shadow also manifests in exercising, in sports, in meditation. Like that, they all, all, all those things that can be considered good uh, hobbies to have because I was engaging them from a part of like self loading and shame became damaging to me. Um, because if I meditated for 10 days in a row, I was happy with myself. And then I'd miss one day of meditation and I was back to being a piece of shit again, more so than I was before I even started meditating in the first place. Like, you know, so um, basically, yeah, when you realize that different parts manifest in you to help protect you so really though that part of me that wanted to say overeat you you and i would have dealt with lots of eating issues in our lives as well from a trying to control things you know because it comes back down to trying to control our behaviors or control our feelings because also in our culture especially in ireland and in lots of places in the world we haven't really been taught as children how to feel feelings and how to process feelings specifically feelings that can be more non-socially acceptable like anger or pain or anxiety or worry you know like once again when those feelings come up in society usually people either leave the people who's experiencing those feelings or ask the people to not feel that way at this period of time because it's not acceptable and when you are not able to feel a feeling that you need to process so for men specifically a lot of it is like uh crying pain anger you know, you push it down inside you. So it's like, uh, for me, I still remember lots of times because I was a very sensitive child and I cried a lot that every time I cried, people made fun of me or every time I cried, something bad happened. So I cried because something bad happened and then the crying made the situation worse because then people would laugh at me. So then I just started to associate crying as being a bad thing. And then through determination and willpower, <clears throat> I was able to, <clears throat> excuse me, stop myself from crying when I wanted to cry. 
And then I remember like, yeah, I dig my nails into my hand, I'd squeeze my hand or I'd bite the inside of my mouth or, <clears throat> you know, I'd squeeze my leg or something and I'd be able to push the, the tears down. And I, and I got really good at that. So, so good that then I actually couldn't cry. <clears throat> so even though something very bad would happen or like as someone might die, you know, or a loved one I knew something bad happened, I just wouldn't be able to cry. And then over periods of time, like those emotions are actual energy, like emotion, energy in motion. Energy has to go somewhere over periods of time. So if you keep pushing stuff down, it's like the analogy that we use again, it's like having a beach ball and pushing it down underwater. You know, first of all, it takes a lot of strength and balance and, and to be able to push a beach ball down underwater, but then also be able to keep it down under the water as well. It takes a lot of energy as well. And we know we all know that eventually at some stage, that beach ball is going to splash back up and hit you in the face. And usually that happens with uh, temper tantrums, um, becoming like emotionally out of control. And unfortunately, most of those outbursts happen around your friend, your family, like your loved one, your partner or your parents. So a lot of the time, once again, for me, you know, it's probably a segue into this IFS in general, but would know me as like a happy go lucky guy. That would have been my reputation externally to my family, even though my family would consider that as well. But that was a part of me. But I also had a part then that was really angry, really sensitive, really upset. But I wouldn't show that to the larger society because that was my little thing to keep behind the wall because I was embarrassed and ashamed about it. And then what would happen, unfortunately, is the people that I cared, cared about me the most and loved me the most would be the only people who I'd feel comfortable showing that side to. So they got the shit, which is I'd come home for a busy day at work or something would happen. And instead of talking about it, I'd keep the emotions buried inside me. And then my partner would say that I, I forgot to take out the bins, which was my turn to do. And she'll call you take out the bins. What do you mean I'm taking out the bins? I'm always doing work for the house. I clean, I take I care of you. I, I work, you know, yeah. this fucking energy vomit all over them as well, you know? So, and then go back into feeling bad about myself because I hurt my partner. Then don't talk about that. And then just bury it down again. And the same thing would happen again. Whereas IFS, the whole point of ISS is to bring those parts inside of us that developed when we were children to help us cope and to help us manage ourselves that we now see as negative parts of ourselves to the surface, to hold space in a safe space where we can see that part, realize that part was created to help us, realize it was a part that was created when we were a child, so it doesn't really know what it's doing as much anymore. That part also was waiting for someone to come along and save us because it wasn't able to do that when we were a child. And now we are that part in our adult form who have now come to take care of the part that wasn't able to take care of itself as a kid. And in regard, then self-parent that part that wasn't parented. And then you can let go of that part. You can That part develops into an adult part, more re 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 realigned with yourself. Instead of pushing that part away or locking it in a drawer, you're now holding hands with it. You're now playing in the field with it. And now you can become more self-regulated and... Um, you don't might maybe need that behavior that you were doing to self suit or self regulate anymore because now in your older adult form you realize that there's better ways or more sustainable ways not use the word better to self regulate and self manage difficult emotions and uh, yeah yeah that's kind of like yeah yeah a brief. it's a really good synopsis yeah yeah and it's like at a certain point in your life it worked for you but that behavior or response pattern isn't serving you anymore so um also like you know anger in men is also there's a really good book called i don't want to talk about it which is about um a lot of men will show uh anger but it's actually a, a depression sim symptom of depression so like awesome. definitely that was a, a big big thing for me um is just anger like being really like repressed anger and not not having dealt with it and in my 20s like I got really big into meditation but it was like uh it was helpful but then it became a es escapism form like I think the term is like spiritual bypassing which is a really interesting thing to to look at it's a big issue with meditation and in I think in general people in the kind of who are drawn towards spirituality 
a lot of the times they are it feels good to you know it's like an outlet it's a community all these things but then it becomes this just a, a pacification tool that's not actually helping them give them the tools to self-regulate when they need it so like i was doing all this meditation but it wasn't really getting to the root cause of all of the challenges the pain the frustration everything mm. and then when i started doing ifs and I, before i started doing ifs i'd been doing therapy for two and a half years and it was all terrible yeah and it was terrible i was like it was all it was reinforcing the shame cycle because yeah. i was like fucking up repeatedly for two and a half years and i was like oh i'm broken that's the issue here it's not the therapy it's just i'm just fucked basically like you know professionally again. and <laughs> what's that you're special because it's i'm special i'm unique else, but not for you like yeah yeah and i think it's just uh you know for people maybe you know for someone listening who is in a position that they're keep repeating the same pattern and mess it, messing up their whatever their relationship or other parts of their life Sometimes it's just, it's literally the tool you're using. So talk therapy works really well for a lot of people. For me, it was not good. Um, just because I, with, with my mother's history of schizophrenia and it was more of a, it just wasn't the right approach for me. Now, the problem was the guy I was working with in Australia, he just worked with me for two and a half years and things weren't improving. Then when I came back to Ireland, the first thing the guy said is like, you should be doing internal family systems or some sort of body work, trauma thing. kind of therapy. Yeah, don't be using talk therapy is just going to pull everything up and make you feel terrible. And yeah. I was like, oh, wow, that's exactly what's been happening. Why is this guy not told me this for two and a half years? So sometimes like the practitioner is so important as well. Uh, yeah. in particular i think with therapy yeah and this guy as well you know he was lots of stuff he was saying was just not good advice in general you know there was no outlets for the you know anger or anything like this um and i think it's also for people who you know we we can kind of we only have like 10 minutes left but like mm -hmm. this kind of goes into the last part that i've been thinking about a lot is just kind of no see big language which is how someone talks to you about something so like i see this a lot now with people i work with with injuries and pain and they go to a doctor and the doctor's like you've got disc degeneration disease and when the, when someone hears that they're like oh my back is i fucked out yeah. <laughs> is wrecked and he's like yeah let's do some scans oh wow the scans show this yeah, you, you know, that's really bad. I think maybe surgery is the next step. And then the person panics, of course, because like this person in, an, in a higher status who's an expert is telling them that they're screwed, basically. Mm. But all of the research around back pain and MRI scans shows, like, I think, like 25% of the population over 40 have some sort of disc degeneration or some sort of disc damage. And so if like one in four people have it with no pain and they're fine, the person who's now showing pain might be fine as well, or it, the disc damage mightn't be the reason that they're having pain. Mm -hmm. So if the doctor was like, look, yeah, the scan is showing this, it's saying disc degeneration disease, but look, one in four people have it. Doesn't mean that you're getting pain from that. Let's actually focus on like staying active, getting stronger. And then, you know, four to six weeks, we'll see how you respond. What's your lifestyle? Um, what are you doing for your day to day? Uh, how, how is everything going at home? Like, you know, like there's just, yeah, there's so much more to it. And as you said, then the mindset of the person then is like, so he, that person is 40 and then they don't see that doctor again. But for the next 40 years, someone's like, what's wrong? How are you getting on? It's all good, but my back's fucked. My back's fucked. And you're telling yourself that narrative, then I have a bad back, I have a bad back. And then, as you know yourself from these stories, like, yeah, you, you will have a bad back. It's like, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, to bring it back to the mental health side of things, like, you know, my mother, she's had schizophrenia, diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia like 30, 30 years ago, this year, actually, 1994. 
<laughs> and, you know, really not good health for many, many years. And in the last 12 months, she's fine. Like she's literally, it's like she doesn't have a mental health condition anymore mm. because she's been getting IFS therapy. And you would wonder, you know, someone telling you that you've got schizophrenia, it's one of the worst labels to be given, I would say. Like societally, it's a scary thing. Like I'm, I'm a two or three in it for sure. Like, yeah. Yeah, like I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to be a serial killer. Like that's the, I, that's what I think. Straight jackets. So yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So someone telling you that, and then there's no recovery from that other than like insane medication that just, you know, does all of these crazy things to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can see, you know, a year of IFS therapy, and she's like. She's brand new, you know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's like, all the all the all the negative thought patterns that you have about yourself, all the negative feelings you have about yourself. As you said earlier on, to bring it back to the dancing, people are looking at me, thinking I'm, you know, this or that. It's like, oh no, it's all about yourself again. And this may be a nice yeah. way to kind of segue to finish the conversation as well as that. It's always about yourself. It's always, always about you. It's never about anybody else. That oh, that person's annoying me. Oh, if I could just get the job if it wasn't for that person. Oh, if I'd be in a better relationship, if this person's doing this thing to me, it's never about them. It's always about you and how you see and view yourself. And yeah, if you see and view yourself as a piece of shit who can't do anything, or if you view yourself as someone who's schizophrenic or it's going to hurt someone in society or it's not going to be able to contribute, like your value for yourself then has just gone out the window. Like, you know, and if you don't think that you're, a valuable person who can help contribute to society, who can, who deserves to be alive, who deserves to have fun, to who deserves to be loved, like you know, which we all strive for. Like that's that's our innate gift when you come into the world. Is like that everybody is enough as they are. It's just with society again. It's just so difficult, isn't it? To like to to process this sensation of like if you don't do anything you're okay. Like you don't need to do anything to be a better person. You don't need to self-develop to develop yourself. You can self-develop to learn about the world and have fun and enjoy yourself. But like, if you're don't want to (laughs) do anything and you're happy doing that, then that's fine as well. It's like finding your own path is so important again, like not because for so long I was looking at other people's stuff and then mimicking them and then not feeling the same way that person was. It's like, well, I'm doing the same thing they were doing. But what I realized I wasn't doing, I was just trying to copy the whole time I wasn't trying to figure out myself I was just trying to pick someone else's gym plan or pick someone else's eating plan or pick someone else's music plan and just do that expecting what they got but now when you change your mindset into like doing things to develop your own character and find out what you like and what you don't like so then if someone's like oh hey do you do jiu-jitsu it's like oh yeah I did that but I don't really like it you're like why didn't I like it that person liked it. I should have liked it too as well. And because I don't like it now, there must be something wrong with me. It's like, bro, if you don't like it, that's cool. Like, you know, it's like, what do you like to do? Well, that's class. Go and do that. So instead, like, you know, or like, it's like, oh, yeah, fast again, it's very empowering because once you start realizing that you're not a piece of shit, that you are loved, that we're all connected, that you're safe, that we are part of something else. I think it comes into like definitely having faith you know, in, in something else, like they're just there, I suppose it's not from a religious point of view again, like, you know, for me, I definitely feel that there's a connection there that we're not aware of. There's something, we're not just bags of bones that are separate from everyone else and living in our heads. I think that that's also helpful to feel that like, if other, if other people get better, you get better. You know, if there is something about community, otherwise everyone could just lock themselves in a room and be very, very happy and content with never seeing anyone again. We know we're habitual creatures. We know that we thrive when we're together. We saw that with COVID, like that was enough of an experiment for people to know that being together in a community is important. When someone else gets better and if we get better together, that's much better than just one person getting better. You know, and if we can just keep stacking on top of each other that growing and experiencing and being there for people, true to good or bad, I think also like realizing that if you're friends with someone or in a relationship with somebody, the best way to get to know them is to get to know them, all of them. Like as in our relationship, I know everything about you, as you said, but I'm so blessed 
that I just don't want to see the funny, happy, go lucky Connor. Like I knew him for a long time before I knew the upset, anxious, vulnerable, worried Connor. But like by getting to meet all the parts of you, I got to know all of you, which then also increased our relationship, which got us closer together, which then means that I was able to show you my other parts, which were difficult too. And then that takes so much worry off you because sometimes in the past you go to meet a friend and you're like, if I'm not <laughs> happy, go lucky, I can't meet this person. And then you just cancel the meeting them and you wouldn't see them. Whereas now I knew if I was to meet you and I was depressed off my head, I just meet you and I just be depressed off my head and it's fine. Like. Yeah. I don't That's have so to good. Be corner like or be shy to be like, oh no. And also it's a uh, you're you're like denying somebody meeting all of you. And that depressed, anxious person is just as beautiful as that happy go lucky person as well. Like, you know, and I just think it's to know someone, I want to know every part of everybody. I think that's what I want to my segue to life again is like I want to experience it all. You know, who knows mm -hmm. how long I'm here for? Who knows if what happened before or afterwards? Because even talking about the connectivity thing. That's a nice thought process to have for sure. But do I know what there is afterwards? Definitely not. Do I know what came before? Definitely not. What do I think about what's it all about now? I think it's about love. I think it's about connection. I think it's about community. I think it's about learning. And if I continue living my life like this, it just feels right. It feels right in my body. It feels right in my mind. It feels right in my heart. And if I was to die tomorrow and to wake up and I realized that it was all a simulation or it was all something and you're like, oh, Carl, you didn't get it right this time, man. I still go back and do it the exact same way I did because every time I pick love and connectivity, it's just, it's fucking good, man. Like it's just never not good. And I wouldn't change it for anything. Like, you know, all the difficulties, all the suffering, all the pain, all the crying, it's been worth it, man, just to get to be where I am now sitting here talking to my best friend, feeling my body, my chest feels good. My hips feel nice. You know, uh, a little bit of anxiety coming up from time to time, even through the conversation, even before I was talking to you today. And that's OK, too. I'm going to experience anxiety again in my life. I'm going to experience love in my life. I'm going to experience being let down. I'm going to experience achievement. I'm going to experience difficulty. And that's just the human condition, bro. And the, the better we get at riding the wave and realizing that you're going to fall off from time to time and just getting back on again, all comes back down to being connected it's all the same fucking stuff <laughs> you know it's just it's okay to be uncomfortable have some support find people that are good to spend time with that that would hold you up that don't put you down and you can fucking do anything like so just keep rocking and rolling keep enjoying things and yet yeah, find good people be happy have fun and drink a quality coffee <laughs> very well said man i think we'll leave it at that brother uh yeah it's just amazing to be able to chat and to finish out the 100th episode with you on it my man <laughs> <laughs>